Hi, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about Benford's Law. The book does a pretty good job describing um, how it's calculated and what you're looking at for data and some of the theory behind it. I want to take a deeper dive into what types of things fit a Benford's Law and what doesn't. Because as accountants, we need to really understand that difference before we find a data set that doesn't conform um, and we you know, and we stop our analysis there. We obviously can't do that. As the book tried to reiterate, finding a data set that does not conform to Benford's law in and of itself does not mean fraud. It just means there are some irregularity. Now, it can be explainable in some situations, which we'll uh, talk about in a bit. Um, and others, that's where you need to do some further investigation. So this is not by any means the end of your evidence um, when trying to determine whether or not you have fraud. So Benford's Law doesn't, you know, it just doesn't really seem feasible, you know, if you don't really think about some of the math and stuff behind it, uh, especially when it comes to things like river lengths and volcanoes and stuff like that, that um, how would this really apply? And it actually does. So Benford tried to explain it, and I think this is a good explanation. It's easier for somebody to buy one acre of land than nine, and you can extrapolate that 1,000 over nine, 100 over 900, uh, et cetera. So when people are, and that's just one example, so buying land, it's easier to achieve those lower numbers. Hence, that's why you see them in higher percentages. So... You kind of look at it at natural numbers versus non-natural numbers. So natural numbers are those that would comply or should comply with Benford's law. So they're not ordered in any particular numbering scheme. They're not human generated or they're generated from some number, random number system. Now, for the human generated, they may come from human generated processes, such as a list of invoices, but humans are not making up the final number. It is a factor of everything that was put on that invoice, quantity times price, add those up plus tax. That's what's generating. So the humans are not generating that final number per se. Non-natural numbers are more systematic and they're usually used to convey information. Uh, so think about postal codes that helps give a define an area. Within Iowa, most of our postal codes are start with a five, for example. Phone numbers, so you have area codes. So that is dictating the spread of numbers. And they're a little bit more static and even throughout. So therefore, they're not going to match a Benford's Law. So just a few more examples. Um, I think the unnatural helps us kind of define what we can and can't use and how to think about the data sets. Uh, so natural, if we took all the numbers in a heavy number-based textbook, say an accounting textbook in chapters 1 through 15, and put them in a data set, generally they would follow Benford's Law. Now you could look at it and see if there's different reasons for it, why a textbook may not, but generally they they typically would. Populations of countries, definitely not human generated. They're not trying to manipulate um, moving people around to fit a law or anything. So they actually fit uh, election data. And if you look on our textbook author's uh, YouTube site, he does some analysis of 2016 and 2020 election data. Um, unnatural, we already mentioned zip codes and phone numbers. So anything human generated, and this is how we really, it's kind of used to discover fraud because humans, when fraud's being committed, usually somebody's making up a fictitious number. And as humans, we're not really good at getting a good even spread. Um, you'll see in some of the cases, uh, I believe Ryan Loma, um, talked about it. He kind of picked the same number over all the time. Uh, so that's how you start to break um, Benford's law and can discover potential irregularity. 
some other things that would not fit heights of NBA players. We don't have too many three foot and four foot NBA players, and we don't have too many nine feet, probably eight feet either. So that has some unnatural barriers to what numbers would be covered. Speeds on interstate, same thing. There's hope. <laughs> Uh, people going 10 miles an hour in the interstate cause a traffic issue. So that's not going to work either. Uh, and of course, rolls of dice. You can't get a nine. Uh, if you're rolling a single dice, if you're getting double, you can only, uh, would definitely not fit either. You still would get more ones because you have a chance of a one, 11, and a 12. But from there on out, the odds would be even. So some other examples. Um, so some of these are from nature. Uh, volcano crater sizes uh, are actually fitting a Benford's pattern. Music, they converted the mu uh, musical notes to numbers and musics of a variety of genres have different pa patterns that follow, are very similar to Benford's. Uh, population of countries, I think we mentioned as well. Uh, square miles of countries. All these are fitting. Uh, I do want to point out there is an episode. We're not going to watch it in class, uh, due to we can't really get everybody together. Um, and I don't know if everybody has Netflix, but I know many of you do. So a, a, a show of interest that I actually found very interesting is the show is called Connected. And there's a whole episode on Benford's Law, and the episode is called Digits. Um, our textbook author is featured in that um, episode, and so um, and they're actually at a conference. So if you're ever interested, there's an entire conference on Benford's Law each year, where everybody who has been studying it gets together. But they talk about uh, everything from music, everything that kind of fits that you wouldn't even can't even really believe. So actually the whole series is interesting. It's about how numbers, things that you would not expect are connected together. Uh, so take a look if you have a chance. Uh, otherwise, add it to your summer viewing list whenever you have a moment. It, as I said, I think you'd find it interesting since you've now talked about it here. So in accounting, some weight, some things that would fit Benford's Law. So invoices. So invoice amounts over a period of time, not necessarily two years. You do have to have a significant amount of data to really look at this. Um, credit card receipts travel and expense. So those types of things are made up of several calculations. So therefore they typically would fit a Benford pattern. Now companies look at travel and expense. So uh, for example, uh, a lot of companies, you need a receipt for anything over $24 or $25. So you're looking for patterns of, if you did the first two digits, maybe looking for an excessive number of $24 extra expenditures. So things that would not fit, uh, invoice numbers, employee IDs, kind of for the same reason as zip codes and uh, telephone numbers. But if you have a data set, so let's say you, it doesn't work for example for every general ledger account. So let's say we have um, an account for an airline baggage fee revenue. Most baggage fees at airlines are a set cost. Uh, I believe it's $30 now at the major airlines for every bag. So you would have a lot of threes and sixes and nines and probably a lot less ones and twos than normal. So there are different pricing or different elements that cause certain data sets to not meet Benford's law. So a few more criteria for the data. Um, so distributions that can be expected. So if the mean is greater than the median, so your average is greater than that middle point given the data and your skew is positive, in other words, to your left, uh, it is more likely to meet Benford's law. <clears throat> Also, um, numbers that come from a mathematical combination, so quantity times price, so those are being uh, made up as well. <clears throat> 
And then things that are at a track transactional level, so disbursement, sales, etc. Things that would not fit. Um, we've already talked about where numbers assigned sequentially, check numbers, invoices, numbers, etc. But things like prices, uh, a list of all the prices in of a database, uh, so say in a Walmart, all the prices probably would not match because some of these prices are set by using what we would call psychological thresholds, a dollar ninety nine, for example. So we would have it's kind of faking, not faking the data, but it's not a natural process that is generating that. Um, so we've already mentioned the accounts with a large number of a specific, so the baggage fees, for example, or $100 refunds, things like that. <clears throat> if you have a minimum or maximum, so you, you can't have a number in this account or this data set less than a certain amount or more than, would automatically affect that. And then other distributions that do not span the entire order of magnitude. So that's where the roll of the dice, uh, if you never have an entry in this account greater than a certain amount or it's always between, your data would not fit that as well. Some other factors um, should represent size or facts or events. So the market values for your Fortune 500s, river lengths, um, the sizes of rivers as well. Uh, GPAs would not conform because most of you don't have an 8.0 GPA by any means. Uh, we have some constrictions there. Uh, identification numbers. So we kind of already looked at all of those. So it's just a good list for you to look at. So some other helpful hints. Larger is better. You can get a distribution of with 150 to 100 data points. It is best to have 500 or more. So uh, the data set that we're looking at has quite a bit more. Uh, there's no constraints limiting what could be the leading digit. So equal opportunity. And the last one I can't emphasize enough. Finding a data set that does not meet Benford's law is not definitive proof. So you need your professional skepticism. Of course, you do. You want to be suspicious. You want to do your further investigation. On the same note, you don't want to jump to conclusions too quickly. But this is a great tool to determine whether or not we possibly have fraud. So if you find a data set that doesn't meet that you think should, Here's what you can, here are some starts of what you should do to look for, look at it a little bit further. So consider whether there's some unnatural or built in bias towards certain numbers. Once again, prices that $1.99, $2.99, etc. tends to force certain numbers a little bit more. Your baggage fees or types of fees that are, it's a constant price or something coming in. Then you want to start doing some additional analytical procedures. If you can't explain why there should be some potential bias or reasons why it shouldn't fit, you want to do some further analysis. So first of all, start looking for any unusual transactions. You know, this is where your data overview can be helpful and you'll start wanting to do some of the other tests that we'll talk about down the line. You know, look for outliers. How does it match over time? Um, what types of accounting or business changes have come in? Have there been some fluctuations or misstatements? And then take a sample of those transactions and go back to the supporting documents. Um, and maybe you have a bit of a bias sample. You're looking at what are the outliers and trace those back. Uh, compare it to last year or maybe the year before. Has this fluctuate, you know, this trend always been there? Um, compared to budgets, and if you need to, go to physical inventory or physical inspection. So inventory is probably your primary example. You can have external confirmations where you ask the bank what their balance is rather than relying on the general ledger, for example. And then look at the uh, internal controls. Do they have adequate controls to prevent unusual transactions in this account? Um, and that may help put your mind at ease that it's okay, but obviously don't, 
you know, you want to combine that with all your other findings before. And then consider the source. So is the data that you obtained straight from your ERP system? Was there other any manipulation after export? Uh, who had control of the file? Things like that. So is it possible that the file was manipulated before you got it as an auditor? So once you find that, you want to go through these. Obviously, you're going to review with your team, uh, partially because two minds, or multiple minds are better at this type of problem solving. But it's a great way to get a feel for the data. Is there potential irregularities? And then try to find an explanation for them. All right. Well, your lab is up next. So um, the there's a video that goes at the lab to kind of introduce that and it will tell you how to set up your Benford's analysis in Excel.